Hey everyone, welcome to another great episode of Life Optimize with um, Dr. Neil Pauvin. And we talk about how to optimize your life, health, and business life with cool tips and information from the experts in their field. And today we are joined by somebody, many, anybody who's been on Instagram in the health field knows his name is Dr. Tyler Jean, who um, is a naturopathic physician. And we're going to talk about pretty much everything in terms of health optimization. And we're going to have everything from nutrition to workout tips, some cool uh, tools that him and I like to use and things that we've, I think some of us have just learned that exist. And uh, we're going to go from there. So uh, Tyler, thanks for hopping on for us today. So uh, introduce yourself. Tell us all about yourself. Yeah, thank you for the introduction, Neil. It's good to be here and, and to connect. And it's been so great to actually meet in person now that I've been here in New York City. And so, so many similar interests. And um, I, like I said, happy to be here. But I have graduated in 2021 uh, from the National University of Natural Medicine in Portland, Oregon, with my degree in naturopathic medicine. And it has always been my mission to learn more about the human body from really a root cause perspective and very holistically as well. I was a former athlete and I really, it was that athletic approach that I think really started to lead me down this rabbit hole of how to optimize the body for performance, right? So I think that's how I got into nutrition and, you know, leveraging various different tools and nutraceuticals um, and all these other things that we have at our disposal in our toolkit uh, to really help the body recover and perform day in and day out. And nutrition is a really big component of that too. I also found a lot of healing in food. I was somebody that struggled with anxiety. I was diagnosed with generalized anxiety disorder in seventh grade. I also struggled with ADHD for very much of the, uh, of my adolescent years and was on medication for all of these things and also had some chronic skin conditions. And so I really found a lot of healing in food and really looking under the hood and how to bring my body back to a state of balance. Some of that was also, you know, looking at what are some of these exposures that I was exposed to in terms of environmental toxicants and the exposome. Uh, some of it too was really just, you know, cutting out some things that were not really great for me, like, you know, binge drinking alcohol and thinking about my alcohol use when I was in college and things like that, that we know are not, you know, great tools, but, um, you know, things that, you know, as a society, we, you know, indulge in or engage in on a daily basis. So it's really through that, that really catalyzed this desire to really study medicine from a more functional and holistic perspective, maybe more integrative. And what I love about the field of medicine that I'm in, in particular, as a naturopathic doctor, is that I just have such a large toolkit to really help meet the patient where they're at. And so, you know, I'm sure we'll talk about some of those different modalities and things that we love to talk about in terms of how we can optimize health, but really, you know, it's really getting back to treating the whole person and looking at the whole body, both from the physical perspective, but also mental, emotional, spiritual as a whole vessel. Perfectly said. Now, I know from following you, uh, I think on social media that you went back to school, correct? You went back to naturopathic school. That wasn't your first career endeavor, correct? I, it, it was my first, um, I guess, graduate school endeavor. At the time okay. I was in clinical, I was in clinical research uh, before, and I actually was in neuroscience research in a laboratory after uh, my uh, undergraduate degree. And it was really through the clinical research experience that catalyzed that desire to actually get into some type of clinical based medicine. But I kind of felt uh, out of alignment with, you know, medical schools and allopathic medical schools where really it's focused on, you know, pathologizing disease and treating disease. And a lot of that is symptom management um, or, you know, suppressing pathology as opposed to actually asking the deeper question is why is the body ex expressing itself in this way? I very look at symptoms as messengers, the body's innate way of trying to communicate with us. And so I feel, felt very out of alignment, you know, looking at going down the route of becoming an MD or DO, I was more open-minded to the DO profession just because of some of the osteopathic manipulations and techniques. But ultimately, um, when I found out about naturopathic medicine, that is really what I felt most aligned with and never looked back since. So, and for those who don't know, I'm going to let Tyler explain what's the difference between naturopathic school is it's, it's a detailed medical program. It just has a more holistic alternative slant as opposed to an MD or DO school, but it's how long is it, is it a set period of time? Yeah, it's a, you have to go to an accredited four year uh, graduate level education and you have to have, you know, your undergraduate degree, your basic bachelor's and meet certain prerequisites. Uh, it's 4,100 hours of um, classroom education, another 1,200 hours of clinical education on top of that. And, you know, depending on what state you practice in, there's also regulations and, and legislation in place in terms for 
um, applying for licensure to have a license to practice medicine. Um, and that is really state by state. And for that reason, uh, naturopathic doctors, there's no federal regulation, it's state regulation. So for that reason, not all states recognize NDs or NMDs, naturopathic medical doctors. Those are two credentialings that you may see for somebody that has attended one of those four-year accredited schools. For this reason, though, not all NDs can apply for license and practice medicine because it is state by state and not federally recognized, at least right now. Which is the shame. And I'm in New York right now, where I think it's still one of those states where you're, you cannot practice, be licensed in ND, and some of the best clinicians are NDs. And it's a shame. And hopefully, I think we're on our way of changing. We're moving that. there. Yeah. And we're really, moving there slowly but surely. It's an integrative approach. That's really the way I see it, too. I don't. I'm not on my high horse thinking like Indies have all the answers because we don't, right? And there's very much a time and place for emergent medicine, trauma medicine, and all forms of medicine. And it's really building that care team for you to meet whatever those goals are that you have. Yeah. And no, I agree. I mean, there's def they have a slant that is very, again, we're trying to flip the paradigm of medicine where it's not problem-based. Oh my God, your heart, your cholesterol is through the roof and you've had two heart attacks or you're diabetic. We want to make sure you never get that. That's my approach. A lot of my patients. And I know it's the same feeling with a naturopathic physician. So that's exactly. where I think medicine should be. I have no idea why it's not. Um, maybe pharmaceutical companies a little bit, but we'll kind of, uh, go work around that. But instead of pharmaceutical companies, I know you have a strong belief in food and how food can help and how you, and your belief and your approach to food and eating. So talk about how in general, what you eat can not only affect everything that's going to affect your weight or may affect your workouts, but how it can affect your health overall. Yeah. Well, if you think about food, food is foundational. We all have to eat. We can't survive without food. We can only, only go a certain amount of time without food. And so we can really leverage food as medicine, but also as information, because the food we eat literally communicates with our genes and influences the way that they're turned on, turned off, turned down, or turned up. A field of study known as nutrigenomics in particular on how the foods we eat influence how our genes are expressed and how those genes ultimately lead and influence the expression of our biochemistry. So very much the food we eat is information. It influences our molecular and cellular level of of, of data in terms of how our body is operating on a day-to-day -day basis. And so, you know, there are certain food compounds in particular, a lot of the classes of like phytochemicals and polyphenols that you're going to find in a lot of brightly colored fruits, vegetables, certain herbs and spices that have a lot of benefits because they can modulate these certain pathways, as well as these stress pathways as well, that can be beneficial for reducing inflammation to bringing the immune system back into a state of balance and also improving cardio metabolic health as well. And so I really believe that we can all leverage that food piece and really, you know, there's so much noise in the nutrition space and there's all these dogmatic diets, whether that is, you know, ketogenic diets or the carnivore diet that is trending or whole food plant based. Everyone seems to have a certain dietary template out there or approach and it's my way is the best, but the reality is, is there's no one size fits all diet for everyone. We're all biochemically unique. And also, you know, there's various different factors that influence what is the best diet for us. And also that is going to change throughout our lifetime. We're dynamic beings. So our needs are going to change. Like you got to think about like, what is your gut microbiome like, right? Cause that's going to influence, um, and determine how you respond to certain foods. You know, what are your stress levels? Like, are you in a heal state right now versus a health optimization state? Because if you're really sick and you are dealing with Lyme, Babesia, Bartonella, you have parasites, you have mold toxicity, your immune system is going to be deranged. And because of that, you're going to probably react to a number of different foods and will probably have a very limited dietary palate. And you may need to restrict certain foods for a period of time in order to get the body back to a state of balance. And you can leverage food to reduce that inflammation and improve that process. But again, this is where it needs to be individualized to, the, to each person. One golden rule that I always talk about on my platform that I share with people because there is so much noise is, you know, any diet except the standard American diet is going to be better or put another way, a diet that is more focused on whole unadulterated real foods and really focuses on micronourishment. So those vitamins and minerals and cofactors that are necessary for running these thousands of different enzymatic reactions in the body. That's where to start. How can we crowd in more whole unadulterated food coming from the earth, as opposed to a lot of this refined ultra processed packaged food that we find in a lot of the supermarkets. Perfectly said. Yeah. I mean, I always tell patients, patients always want that one diet that's out there. There's no such thing. And it, it, it's a moving target. You got to find what works for you. 
Um, it's not, it's just not something that if somebody, if you go to a physician or a health coach or a nutritionist says you must be keto or you must be Mediterranean, you know, this, they probably don't get it. I mean, as you really, really well said, there's so much variation. Things change when you're healthy, what your workout routine is. I mean, in females, things change with their cycling of the hormones. If somebody has some type of unfortunately chronic disease, be it an autoimmune issue or Lyme disease, which has its own own combination of issues. It think, it's a moving target. You want to work with somebody who understands that and that you can learn the first time you speak with somebody, and which is just a very important idea. So you mentioned nutrigenomics and genetic testing. So if when you see a client or patient, and is that something that you're waiting to see what the results are before you would treat somebody? Is that something that you kind of get them starting up something basic? Where does it fall into how is it the best implemented for somebody who's looking to do that? Right. I think it really depends on the patient or the client and what their baseline level of knowledge is. There's some people that have no nutrition background. So you give them all this information. It's completely overwhelming. They're not going to make any changes, right? It's just too much information. So I feel like it's, what is your baseline knowledge and what are those goals? And I think also communicating too, like this is a process, right? Whether it is you're trying to reduce inflammation in the body, you're trying to get your metabolic health back in check. You're trying to lose weights, improve certain markers, um, as it relates to metabolic health, like it takes time. And so making small changes is really going to lead to small actionable outcomes that is going to inspire somebody to want to make more changes, right? So throwing the kitchen sink at somebody isn't always going to be beneficial. What I will do if I'm starting with somebody is we're going to look at, do you restrict any foods? And if you do, why do you have an allergy or do you have a sensitivity? Or is it just something that you notice you're your body doesn't vibe with it, right? Like you don't feel well. I'm always interested in that information. It's like, oh, I don't do gluten or I don't do dairy. I'm like, so what happens if you do? Like that gives me information, right? And for some people, I mean, there's so much food aversion and food phobia right now. Like that's a lot of focus that I've been focusing on and how we can, at the, I mean, first and foremost, let's remove the offending factors of why people are sick, but also improve people's relationships with food and, you know, realize that we're all doing the best that we can. And with that, you know, there may be an initial elimination protocol where we do like an elimination diet, which is my favorite tool to utilize as opposed to jumping into food sensitivity testing or intolerance testing, um, or even allergy testing. Um, and I'll walk somebody through that for four to six weeks and then systematically introduce some of those foods with the ones that are going to be most nutrient dense first. And the ones that are maybe not as nourishing, but potentially antigenic we will reduce those later on. And just really giving people to become more aware how food affects them. I really believe having that awareness is a superpower. And so, you know, that first and foremost for anybody that's listening to this is start to tune in when you eat certain foods, how does that, how does that make you feel? Do you notice that it triggers things that it, it causes certain things to flare up? Like that is good information that your doctor is going to want to know. Person, We're into all this tech stuff now, but having just having a food diary, be it no matter what, okay, certain, this food gives me bloating or this food gives me brain fog and then a having it for themselves and seeing if it's repeatable one time thing, things can happen once. And it's not always may, may, it may be something, a long-term issue. It may just be a coincidence, but if you see something repeating and repeating and it's something that's good for you to know, and that's something to give to your, your healthcare provider, because they can take that information. Like you said, you can extrapolate from there and develop a bigger plan. And I, I, it's really good um, information there. So when, are you doing specific tests for nutrition? Are you doing urine tests? Are you doing uh, blood spot testing? Are there certain tests you really like that feels that give you the most information? Yeah. I mean, I'm not doing any specific test that is looking at individualized nutrition from the lens of nutrigenomics in particular. Um, I don't do DNA testing. If that's something that somebody else wants, I will refer out. Um, it's just not the level that I want to go to. And I find it quite costly sometimes and not necessary to start. What I will use sometime is Spectracell or Nutricell, um, or Nutraval, should I say, which will look at a lot of your micronutrient status and fatty acid markers too, and even antioxidant status to kind of see, all right, you're deficient and your body's using a lot of these certain nutrients. And this is how we can support that through food before we even get into supplementation. Because for some people, they, they like to see data. They want to see hard, you know, information that it's like, oh, I'm clearly not getting enough of this. I need to actually support myself in this. And I'm always an advocate of food first supplementation. Definitely. It can be necessary and warranted, especially for people that have overt symptoms due to nutritional deficiencies. And again, if there's also this constellation where we know somebody has multiple, you know, they have complex chronic illness, they have a diagnosis of Lyme, let's say, or they're dealing with chronic EBV, or they have small intestinal bacterial overgrowth and gut dysbiosis, or 
they have, you know, multiple autoimmune diseases. Like I, that will kind of tailor how I'm going to dictate some of the, the dietary interventions as well. And maybe for that period of time, going a little bit more low FODMAP or going a little bit low histamine or, you know, really going a little bit further where we're removing more foods and following an autoimmune paleo diet for a period of time, just to reduce the inflammation, improve their quality of life and tolerability to some of these things as we start really working and focus on those root causes. But in terms of genetic testing, that is not something that I start with and do personally. For those listening out there, Tyler has a great nutrition program and he's espousing how it should be done in terms of, again, bobbing and moving and adjusting to what patients have, fixing the foundational things and you move on. So it's part of the nutritional program. You brought it up several times already. It's not just about what you're eating, but your attitude, your feeling about food and how it fits into your life. How, how do you make your uh, patients aware of that? Because both, that's something that most people think about. They think, okay, I'm eating this many calories, this is my macros. But I'm seeing it more and more is how you feel about food or how you use food is also just as important. It is. And at the end of the day, I mean, food, yes, is nourishment first and foremost, but also there's a lot of communion around food, right? There's some nostalgic memories that we all have probably around the holidays and certain family gatherings around food. And it can be really difficult to be on extremely restricted diets and be in some of these settings and can provide a lot of unnecessary stress. And also when people try to go out and eat at restaurants or if they're traveling, um, it is a very real thing that people have so much food phobia and food fear. So I think that first and foremost is important to improve people's relationship with food and not, and, and, and throw out, you know, the idea of perfectionism, right. And that sure there's a lot of processed packaged foods and sugary foods and stuff that, you know, people will say you can enjoy moderation, but if you're really thinking about it, it's, I try to tell people it's what you do most of the time and not what you do some of the time. So if you're really focusing on that foundation, it's kind of like that 80% mentality of like 80% of the time, I'm really focusing on wholesome foods that are very nutrient dense for me. And my body really loves and then some of these other times I'm, in, I'm indulging or I'm enjoying some of these other foods that maybe are more nutrient poor and are more refined, but still at the same time, listening to how my body responds, because if I'm eating, you know, let's say some apple pie, because that sounds really good. But then I wake up the next day and I have brain fog and all my joints ache. Well, that's something that, you know, your body's trying to communicate with you that something's going on. And so it is constantly this dance. Um, in terms of how our body is responding and what our needs are and really trying to tap in and listen to that innate intelligence and knowledge that the body has and, you know, giving yourself more grace and compassion and trying to throw out some of these food rules that we've created in, in the health and wellness and diet culture and really, you know, be informed, but live life at the same time. Perfect. Now, can patients do uh, all these different things at the same time? Again, I, it's kind of like juggling or kind of bouncing these ping pong balls. So what is the starting point? How many things are you, what are the most important things to introduce initially? And then you have to kind of like layer and layer, or you just say, okay, here's, here's a, my three cores of my program. This is the few things that you need to do, mm -hmm. or is it, can you just kind of, this is, this is what you need to do overall. How do you kind of focus with patients and get them started and not them saying, Oh my God, what is he making me do? I'm right. I, I, I can eat three foods now and I have to write my food down and I'm thinking how I like food. And it's like, it's a, it's a lot for some, some people are really into it. And some people are like, freaking out, running right out, back out the door. So right. how do you approach that with, you, with what we do with clients? Absolutely. And then the other thing too, to think about it too, is like a lot of people don't know how to cook. And so there may be like the desire Me? to eat some of these foods and follow a low allergen diet, let's say, because, you know, they notice that they feel better, but it's like one, I mean, if you're, if you're going to restaurants that follow some of these low allergen diets and like catering to all these food sensitivities and allergies, it's often going to be more expensive. Two, um, you know, a lot of times too, is like, there's, a, there's an accessibility piece to that too. Like we're lucky that in New York and where I am in Los Angeles as well, like we have a lot of access to a lot of these great restaurants that are very accommodating and have gluten-free options or soy-free options or dairy-free options for people that have certain sensitivities and allergies. But if you're living in, you know, the Southeast parts of the United States or in the Midwest, like, you know, you're, you don't have as many of those options, right? So it can be so much more difficult and you actually have to prepare all your foods. And so what I'll start people with is a handout on what an elimination diet is, those foods that you may want to remove or that we want to remove for the period of time, the foods to focus on. And I actually have a, a recipe e-cookbook that I developed three years ago um, that people can find on my website at tylergene.com. And it's 40 wholesome nutrient dense recipes. So really think about nutrient density, and even kind of putting it together and pairing these recipes to think about food synergy, bioavailability in terms of preparation methods, and is all based on an elimination diet and a low allergen diet. So it's no gluten, no soy, 
no dairy, no peanuts, no eggs. Um, it's basically grain free for the most part. I think there's five recipes, but there's 40 recipes in there. And what that does is it just gives people ideas and inspiration of where to start if they want to start cooking. And for some people, maybe it's not, we're going to start perfect, right? We're going to be like, how can we reduce the consumption of some of these things? Because maybe we're doing an intake and we've identified that gluten is probably an issue. And maybe we'll even run if there's, you know, a history of celiac in the family and we suspect that we may run a panel for celiac or we may do, you know, um, a gluten sensitivity test as well, uh, looking at uh, anti-gliadin antibodies or something. But for those individuals, maybe they're having cereal for breakfast, they're having a sandwich with potato chips for lunch, and they're having pasta with meat sauce for dinner. That's grains or gluten for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. For maybe, so for that individual, maybe we're starting with, let's make one of those meals gluten-free. So we're reducing the frequency of how much of that food, right? So you to think about the context of how much, or if let's say for breakfast, they're going to do a sandwich. It's like, let's choose a better option. Maybe there are gluten-free options out there, but maybe we're going to choose a sprouted organic bread because that's going to be easier on the digestive crop track. And it's also going to be, um, you know, less inflammatory to the gut because it's breaking down certain of these, you know, phytonutrients and anti-nutrients, right. For someone else, that's maybe a little bit more up to par with things, right. These people may be more gung ho and they're able to go in and, you know, to completely cold Turkey change their diet. So really, I think the answer to this is it depends on the individual and meeting the patient where they're at and asking them, what are those obstacles that is going to prevent you from achieving these outcomes? Like, like, where do you need the support? I think that is really an important role of like this power dynamic and this relationship with a client or, or a physician and a doctor of really figuring out and working together on a plan that's actionable because at the end of the day, I may have the best plan, but if the patient or the client isn't going to you know, execute on it, it really doesn't do us any good. I need to get that cookbook because I cook like four things. My wife is so sick of them. I need to like, I need some variety. I need to, I need to check. I will send it to you. I will there send you it go. to you. And then I, again, like you said, with main is I'm in, I live right next to a vegetarian, gluten-free Indian restaurant. So, I mean, you can literally find anything in Manhattan, LA that will appease whatever sensitivity or what your likes are. If you're in the Midwest, it's a little tough. I can, I've been there and I can totally attest to it. So you mentioned a lot of different types of approaches. So if somebody's out there and are there certain, if you can give them three, four foods to look at, meaning they may know about them, may not know about them, that if they could include them in their meal plans, they're not only going to, or not only going to be healthy for them, may actually improve their health. What would you recommend for people to look at? Yeah, I'd say the first and, for, first and foremost is the food group of uh, fatty fish that contain these long chain omega-3 fatty acids. We know from the literature, especially specifically with a lot of the literature with supplemental doses, high doses of EPA and DHA fish oil, that it has a lot of potent anti-inflammatory benefits. It's also beneficial for the gut. We're seeing benefits to neurological health and even dementia. Um, there are numerous benefits to these long chain fatty acids that you're going to find in things like salmon, sardines, mackerel, anchovies, trout. Um, and so I really advocate for people to try to get at least two, if not three servings of cold water, oily fish into their diet per week. If you abstain from fatty fish, you can go the route of trying to incorporate some of these short chain omega-3 fatty acids that you're going to find in plant-based sources, things like flax and chia and hemp and certain nuts like walnuts. Um, there are a subset of the population though that have do not convert these short chain omega-3s, ALA, into these longer form chains that have more of these potent anti-inflammatory benefits and also these um, neuroprotective benefits as well. Um, so that is something that you can test through some of these. Um, I use Omega Quant, but also like the, the Spectrocell and, and NutriVal that will also test some of these things as well. I also know the Great Plains Lab has some tests that will also look at some of the um, their fatty acid markers, but that is important because so many people are deficient in omega-3 fatty acids and oversaturated in omega-6 fatty acids because of our overconsumption of a lot of refined processed packaged food. And as well as when we eat out, we are getting a lot of these vegetable oils in our diet, which is the big source of these omega-6s. So that's the first one is really trying to focus on a lot more of these cold water um, fatty fish. Two would be trying to incorporate more fiber. The majority of the US is fiber deficient. And now Fiber is not an essential nutrient and it's not classified as an essential nutrient, but it's considered a non-digestible carbohydrate. 
some of the benefits of fiber that are so great and elucidated in the literature is that it helps to stabilize blood sugar. It's going to break down more slowly. It's not going to be rapidly broken down and absorbed into the bloodstream and rise and lead to a rapid rise in blood sugar. So again, leading to more stable blood sugar, what we call postprandial blood sugar, it's going to aid in more satiation and fullness because that fiber is going to stretch these mechanoreceptors or these baroreceptors that can sense you know, pressure and therefore sensitivity signals to the brain. So it prevents us from overeating. It's going to add more volume to food, right? Think about what are these fiber rich foods? It's vegetables, it's plant-based food, right? Cooked greens, mushrooms, asparagus, broccoli, right? It's going to add a lot more volume. So it makes you feel like you're eating a lot more, but calorically you're eating less uh, as opposed to, as opposed to a lot of these hyper palatable foods. The other thing too, with fiber too, is we know it feeds the beneficial bacteria in our guts, the gut microbiome, right? But even the oral microbiome as well, we are more microbes than we are human cells. And we now know from a lot of the research that came out of the human genome project is that the microbes and the bacteria produce these things called metabolites. And, and some of these metabolites are these your short chain fatty acids. And it's these byproducts of bacterial fermentation from fiber. So again, we can't digest the fiber, but the bacteria in our gut can, and the byproducts that waste in a way that they create, these are signaling molecules that can go all throughout the body and influence our metabolic health, our mental health, reduce inflammatory levels, influence and strengthen our immune system amongst other things. Right. And so I'm really encourage people to increase their fiber consumption through the consumption of more whole foods, especially plant foods, because it's low in sugar, it's high in fiber, and it's going to aid in satiation. And we see in the literature, the application and the association of higher fiber diets in conditions like PCOS, cardiometabolic health. Um, so a cardiovascular disease, cancer, hemorrhoids, um, inflammatory bowel conditions. Although for some individuals, they need to go slower with the inclusion of fiber because it may flare things, but all of that to say, start slow with increasing the amount of plant matter over time, increase your water consumption. And don't, if you're only consuming five or 10 grams of fiber, you want, don't want to like all of a sudden start consuming 40 to 50 grams the next day, because you definitely will have loose stools um, and probably um, abdominal pain as well, because your body's just not used to it yet. But if there's one big thing, it's increasing your fiber, it's increasing those omega-3 fats. And then the last thing that I encourage people to do is try to get more spices and herbs into their food. That's going to add more flavor. It's going to add more color. It's going to bring more enthusiasm in the kitchen. But we also know that a lot of the phytochemicals and the active constituents in these spices actually have a lot of medicinal benefits as well by altering in a way epigenetic signaling and also nutrigenomics. So how our genes are expressed also influencing the gut microbiome, but also helping to squelch uh, oxidative mediators and free radicals that can contribute to tissue damage and inflammation. So those are the big three omega threes, spices and herbs, get those into all your meals, things like food or kitchen medicine. And then the last one would be incorporate more fiber into your day-to-day -day meals. Love it. I want to do a little deeper dive with all those things that you did to unpack it for people out there. And I'll start in terms of spice. I mean, there's everything from, we know, curcumin has benefits. We know oregano has benefits. I mean, there's spices that are just something that add, they said they add taste. They have their own anti-inflammatory benefits. They help heal the gut. They may help things like PCOS, insulin sensitivity, all of the above. And that's something that, again, very simple to do with your meals. Then you mentioned in terms of the gut health, where I think I'm going to try to do a little deeper dive here in a minute, but the, the importance of the, the small, the, the SCFAs and the small chain fatty acids and the connection to the brain, which were, and all those other are so important. So you want to eat for your microbiome and that's where fiber is definitely a part of that. And then you, for people to, and to clarify in terms of what uh, Tyler was talking about in terms of omega-3s omega are great. They're anti-inflammatory. You need them for the brain health. When, when, when he's testing for them, you're looking at omega-3, omega-6 ratio. You want the omega-3s to be higher. Omega-6s can be pro-inflammatory, so can omega-9. You're looking, then we get to big medical words like alpha linolenic acid and things like that to show up on those tests. And Tyler can, by looking at those numbers, can see if, if A, if you're getting enough that you need, and B, or is what you're taking in the wrong types and you're actually not only not get, maybe gaining weight, but also going to have some medical issues associated with it. So it's not just, again, not just about the calories, it's about how this is overall affecting your health. Yeah. So just really great information there. So like, is that, so when in the kitchen, I know, again, it's something I've seen on your social media um, in terms of 
Now, when I'm talk- food's not the only thing that's important. It's how you cook in the kitchen. There's certain things yeah. you should not be using in the kitchen. There's things that you should definitely be using in, your, in the kitchen. So is that um, what information do you want to give uh, out there now in terms of what pot should we be using and flame? I mean, th- this has become its own separate category in terms of uh, what people should and should be doing when they're cooking their food. Yeah. So, um, you know, the kitchen is really important and there's a lot of products that we may be using and in, in our kitchen that may be convenient, but may not be the best for our health. And some of these things are plastic. So thinking about a lot of the plastic Tupperware and, and containers that we may have in our kitchen um, and how we may even be heating some of these things up in the microwave, even if they're microwave uh, safe um, and how these microplastics can basically leach into our food. And then when we consume that, these microplastics or these plastics and things like uh, this phenols um, can get into our bloodstream. And what we know is that a lot of these plastics and things like this phenols, um, that they are known endocrine disruptors. So they can actually interfere with uh, and almost mimic the responses of, of various different hormones within our body. And there's a whole class of these, you know, things like phthalates and, and, and bisphenols and stuff like that that are known as obesogens. And these are a class of chemical compounds that actually can um, contribute to obesity and excess body mass because of the way that it interferes with cell to cell signaling, as well as interfering with um, how the body is able to properly regulate um, certain metabolic pathways as well, and also contribute to insulin resistance. And so, you know, one thing is the food component in terms of like thinking about our metabolic health, but also very much the things that we have in the kitchen can be contributing to this as well. And so, you know, you're going to find bisphenols and in, 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 in BPA and even like BPS and BPF, there's all these different types of bisphenols in canned goods. And so usually it's lined, those canned goods have those bisphenols in them. Um, you'll also find them in paper goods. So if you are going and get your morning coffee every day and you have that, that paper cup, it's usually lined with a thin layer of plastic um, in order for that coffee or that tea to prevent it from saturating through that paper cup, right? And so you're heating that up. You're actually heating up those plastics when you are ingesting those things. It's a sad reality. And this is why it's great if you can you know, bring your own re- reusable cup or thermal cup or stainless steel flask. Um, but other things that you're going to find that too, you're going to find in those plastic bins. So if you can swap out plastic storage bins for glass, that is going to be better to reduce a lot of the plastics in your environment. I love, you know, blend tech Vitamix, um, and your, uh, the Ninja I know is another one that a lot of people will use for blenders, but I also see Everybody a lot of should have a Vitamix. Everybody in their house should have, a, should just be, you haven't moved into your house or apartment. There's a Vitamix built in like your refrigerator. It's the best thing. You can make sm- soups, smoothies, and sauces and all the things, right? But the one thing I will say, though, is like with a lot of these plastics, um, you know, you don't want to add hot foods to that, especially with fat, because the fat plus heat and any type of acid is going to lead to more of whatever material is in that plastic um, to to really leach out and, 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 and actually end up in our food. So those are some things you want to consider. Um, the other big class is definitely cooking um cooking utensils, but also a lot of your cookware. So a lot of people, we love nonstick cookware because it's easier to clean. The eggs that we're cooking don't stick or we're cooking um, a piece of meat on, 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 a, on a little like ca- uh, grill or something like that on the stovetop. Um, but a lot of these contain these perfluorinated compounds and these compounds such as Teflon uh, and PFAS um, also have the ability to disrupt our hormones in the body. And the thing with these compounds in particular is that they um, can bioaccumulate in the body for quite a long period of time. They aren't readily broken down. And so they can actually get stored in our tissue um, because they are so persistent, right? And the more adipose tissue you carry, the more fat tissue that you have, a lot of these compounds, depending on if they're water or fat soluble, but a lot of different of these environmental toxicants that we're exposed to, are fat soluble, they actually are going to really get stored in more of these fat reserves that we have. So it's almost like the more um, fat reserves that you have, the more of these fat soluble compounds that can actually bioaccumulate in these areas. And there's a number of different ways that our body actually clears these things, which we can talk about, right? But there's some individuals that they have such a high exposure and maybe they have impairments and biotransformation, how they're able to get rid of these things that they can bioaccumulate in the body and actually lead to health um, health effects, um, specifically as it relates to inflammation, it can in, interrupt with hormones. We're even seeing links to cancer and various different, um, hormonal related cancers as well. 
um, amongst other things. And so that is something that we want to be aware of and opt for things like stainless steel, um, 100%, 100% ceramic or even cast iron uh, in terms of cooking uh, utensils trying to, I'm not as big of a fan of uh, silicone for a lot of baked goods and even like using silicone for, you know, cooking utensils and stuff like that. Like wood is going to be a better option or, you know, at the end of the day, it kind of comes back to that balance. Like I'm doing good most of the time, but some of these other times I'm going to just, you know, I have to flex a little bit because I want to make some cupcakes and these silicone baking tins are great. And I'm going to use a type of thing like that. So those are kind of the things that I start with with people. And then water is another important one too, which we can talk about if you want to, but getting a good filter for your tap water is important. Um, while thankfully we don't deal with necessary, like a lot of these bacterial infections and different things in our water that can make us acutely ill. It's these low exposure of all these different metabolites that are, can be in our tap water, heavy metals, chloride, fluoride, stuff like that, chlorine and fluoride that can really lead to a lot of cumulative effects long-term when we are exposed to these um, over several, several years. Yeah. So I always get asked, so do you have a, and you're, you try all this stuff out. So do you have a favorite water, water filter, both port, I get it, depending on what your living situation is, either portable or some that you can build into your living situation? Yeah, that's a great question. I don't have an under the counter, uh, water filter. I have uh, countertop filters. I know some people, they don't want a countertop filter. They want something that they can actually install for the whole house. And that also kill, includes, you know, like their shower and bath and all water that's running through the house. The two leading water filters on the market that are most popular are your Berkey water filter and your AquaTrue uh, water filter. They're two different types of water filters. They both are great. So whatever's in your budget, you know, that's going to be better than drinking tap water, right? Like we can get into the minutia of things, but anything's better than drinking tap water. Um, one is a reverse osmosis filter. That's the AquaTrue. It's going to remove everything. By going through a four stage filtration system, there's a carbon filter, there's the reverse osmosis filter, and they have a volatile organic compound filter as well. And the Berkey works differently in that it is works with gravity and the sedimentation filter. And so it's going to remove impurities through that and through weight. Um, but both are going to be, you know, great options depending on what your budget is, but that is a foundational thing for everyone. Like we need to drink water. And so drinking good water and reducing the amount of exposures we have to a lot of these um, persistent organic pollutants, volatile organic compounds, and these different me metabolites that are in our water. Um, that is something that we can all do. And is one of the best investments you can do in your health. If you're just starting on a health journey. And, and don't worry about getting all this information, all these names of different uh, lab tests and products. We're going to put them in the notes at the end. So don't worry about it. You can always pull them up at the end and, uh, get them all, all the information that you need. So the, I want to go back to what you had said in the initial part of this conversation in terms of like BPAs and phthalates and what the studies are now showing and the things that I'm seeing, and I'm sure you see as well, is that we're getting a lot of patients in their 30s, 40s, even their 20s who have hormonal issues, either not having a women who are not having a menstrual cycle, have irregular cycles, and men who have low testosterone or feel like they have low testosterone. And we know that those, those pollutants, be it BPAs or phthalates and all the other ones that we went through, you went through, can actually lead to low testosterone. The body can't make it, can't break it down. And then what happens when you have low testosterone, you gain weight, especially or in women, especially when they have a problem with their hormones. And if that leads to things like PCOS or other issues, it causes it deposits in the fat, which causes weight gain, which leads to other issues. And it's just unfortunately the snowball effects. So the moral of the story is do not put your Dunkin' Donuts, your Starbucks thing back in the microwave and then drink it again. And that will solve every health problem. No, but it's definitely something that you should not be doing. Um, that's one simple thing that if you could institute one thing, don't do it. It's just got a, it's got a total domino effect in terms of your health there. So yeah. um, I don't know if this will shift the conversation, but I was also going to say one of the best things you can do, I mean, one, reduce your exposure, but two, um, there is some evidence to suggest that, you know, sauna use and using saunas, which is one of my favorite tools to use on a daily basis, can also help excrete some of these different environmental toxicants. Um, there was the bus study in particular that they did looking at specifically urine versus sweat analysis of excretion of various different heavy metals, but also some of these, you know, um, plastics and, and bisphenols as well, bisphenols in particular. Um, and so, you know, looking at how you can support those among trees and those organs of elimination and secretion um, are going to be ways that can help to reduce that bio, bio accumulated load that we are exposed to over time. 
you know, sauna. I mean, the, the list of, I think every week a new benefit um, comes out about sauna. Um, I mean, if you listen to Rhonda Patrick, who's, I think every week has some new article about it, it improves your exercise. They have, if you do it after your exercise, it improves the benefits after your exercise. It's great for detox. It lowers blood pressure. I mean, um, I mean, I do you have a recommendation to your clients. I recommend around three times a week. I know I see how, how often you try to do it or recommend to your patients. Um, well, I can say for individuals versus myself, I do sauna five times a week, uh, basically. And, um, I, I, I get that information based off that, that, um, cohort study that they did of, was it 23,000 Finnish men, or maybe it was 2,300 Finnish men, uh, and looking at basically all cause mortality and, and, um, also looking at, um, risk of cardiovascular disease and those that sauna bathed less than four times a week. And those that sauna bathed four to seven times per week. And there's a much greater reduction in all cause mortality and cardiovascular related death. And those that, you know, did at least 20 minutes of dry sauna four to seven times a week. So for me being a very vital person, young person, I love to do that. I'm just making sure that I'm repleting electrolytes and listening to my body for some individuals, you know, it really depends on if they have access to an own personal sauna or one at the gym, or they're going into an office where they're doing, you know, sauna that is going to dictate things. I mean, three times a week, every other day can be a really great place to start. Some people though, that have a really high, um, toxic burden and are really sick. Sometimes the people that need it the most, they also may feel really ill when they're using a lot of saunas, especially if they're doing a lot up front. So it's something that you mean to kind of approach low and slow and work with your doctor to kind of figure out what is that right tailored dose um, as you're kind of working through a lot of these things. I think it's a New York versus LA thing too. Because I know you're, you're, in New York, it's hard when you have an apartment with like a thousand square feet to try to put a sauna in there, unless you have one of those little portable ones, but some of them actually are pretty good. It's hard to get to a sauna space every day, every five times a week, five times a week is great. I think it's, a, and then in the wintertime, the last thing you want to do is try 30 minutes to go to a sauna. Um, but it's def, definitely, I agree, the studies do back up that if it's, if you've one in your house or you can, again, I don't know if you, how you feel about the, the portable ones, like the relax sauna. I, there are some good studies that show that those are still beneficial. They don't get as hot as a dry sauna right. um, or even some of the infrared saunas that are, that like um, sunlight and some of the other brands. And, and that's a whole thing we can get into in a second in terms of what you want to look for in a sauna. Cause not every sauna, even though they have a lot of studies behind them, certain studies, certain saunas will have problems with them um, in terms of leakage or EMF. I mean, there's whole different things to them and what they're made of. And again, I, I have friends who told me things, I'm like, what? I, and, and it's great to know that there's, again, even things that are good have some problems with them. So I don't know if you have a preferred sauna, if you want to, if you want to break that down a little bit. Yeah. Um, I, so what you want to look for is one and ask the manufacturer if they test for EMFs, especially for these portable ones that are, um, you know, they plug into the outlet type of thing like that. I mean, these can be great because it's lower price point. So it's, it's lowering the barrier to entry in terms of costs, as opposed to like a wooden sauna that can be anywhere from three to $10,000. Uh, these other ones on the market are probably somewhere between 600 to $1,100 for the portable saunas, depending on the type. Um, you know, ideally you want to see that it is full spectrum. So you're getting the full, you know, near mid and infrared rays, as opposed to just one aspect of those, of those rays. And again, that's going to be different. You know, we're also kind of like, there's differences between infrared saunas and dry saunas. Should we just dis discuss the difference between that or? Yeah, actually it does. It matters. Uh, definitely. Okay. So, so what we're talking about for a lot of these portable ones, they are typically infrared saunas. And so what these are infrared rays penetrate the skin and they are a deeper type of heat where they kind of basically heat you up from the inside out, out. Um, and this can be really great for yes, helping you, you know, break a sweat and help with detoxification and liberating a lot of these, um, these toxins that can be in the system, but also it's, you know, it is going to increase your heart rate. It's going to improve your cardiovascular fitness. Um, and it also has a lot of anti-inflammatory benefits as well, where a dry sauna, a finished sauna, a typical finished sauna is going to heat up the ambient air around you, causing you to sweat. Now, the other thing too, is a dry finish sauna or dry sauna typically is going to be much hotter compared to an infrared sauna, which is going to be lower in terms of the, the temperature, right? Most people may only be able to tolerate somewhere between 10 to 20 minutes, 25 minutes in a dry sauna, where in an infrared sauna, some individuals can tolerate up to 40 to 60 minutes, depending on how warm it is. And so those are some of the differences, but with the, you know, portable ones, it's typically going to be infrared sauna. You want to look at, do they test for EMFs for these infrared saunas? And so that is something to ask some companies. 
um, very proudly, you know, use this as a marketing tool to say that it's low EMF or, you know, basically negligible EMF. Uh, Cause the last thing you want to do is also be bathing yourself in EMFs when you are in an infrared sauna. Looking for full spectrum is another thing I would look at. Um, and so again, looking at all those different rays, the near, mid and far. Other thing too, is you may want to think about off-gassing material. So what is the different materials that are made with that? Uh, because some of these can be, uh, they use certain materials and even, um, you know, chemical repellents and stuff like that on there too. So it doesn't get saturated with sweat. And that can also lead to, you know, respiratory irritation and other things of just like other exposures you don't want to get exposed to in your indoor home environment. Um, the last thing that I'll say too is um, looking for something that you can clean easily. I think that's important as well because it can also like as you're sweating and again, these very like hot environments can also be breeding ground for mold if you're not like keeping up with maintenance and stuff like that. Um, and the material is really like saturating a lot of the, of the sweat and perspiration that is coming out. So for me personally, Therasage has been the brand that I have used for three and a half years. Um, I do have an affiliation with them. Um, but outside of that, um, I have not worked with them as a sponsor, but I do genuinely love their products and, um, have had a lot of great testaments from clients and individuals that have used it. And they are very low in EMS. It's full spectrum. They use non-off gassing material. They build in, they have tourmaline stones built in there that kind of helps to create like a harmonizing uh, field around the unit as well so that it, it can help to mitigate, mitigate those EMFs. But that is the only one that really has been on my radar that I have used. I don't know which one you recommend uh, to your patients. I like Therasage you like. as well. I love Therasage as well. Like I said, it, it's not big. It, my apartment's not big enough for one yet. Okay. <laughs> so we're, I, I'm waiting for a move here to, to have all these things that we're going to probably talk about. But yeah, Therasage, I like. I mean, Sauna Space has some good data actually okay. as well. Um, but again, that you hit it perfectly. Just the, if you're going to go into a dry sauna, that's usually the one where you're dropping the rocks in and you have towels. And if you have a medical issue, like high blood pressure or a heart issue, make sure you talk to your doctor or a healthcare provider. Make sure that's okay that, that you're doing that, especially if you're on some type of diuretic or water pill, because you're going to go in there and get dehydrated. And then you're just potentially leading yourself to problems. And I know something I've seen you talk about as well. When you hydrate, it doesn't mean when you do leave a sauna, you don't, you need to hydrate and replenish your electrolytes. It doesn't mean go get a Gatorade or a Powerade. It means find a low sugar electrolyte drink. Um, Element is, I like Element, um, as well as, of course, down blanking. Uh, Redmond Salt also makes, I like um, Himalayan Salt makes now a new Inlight or Mlight or something like that which is really good. I don't know if you have a recommendation there, but those are things you eat. The sauna is great, but you want to rehydrate the same way as well. Otherwise you may be zonked out for the rest of the day, especially if you do a dry sauna. Yeah. I mean, I love elements and, um, and Redmond's real salt as well. And they have a relight powder, which is the, it, you know, mm -hmm. it has all the different electrolytes and the salt in there too. I also even will recommend with some people, um, to salt load and actually do, you know, a teaspoon of salt in water before you can get in the sauna. Cause you're going to really, you know, a lot of your sweat is, is sodium, sodium chloride. And so it's just, you want to make sure that you're getting those electrolytes before and after. And some of the things that I also like to do is I love to just do filtered water and maybe put in like a fourth, a cup of coconut water, or half a cup of co coconut mm -hmm. water. So it's a natural source of electrolytes, especially potassium. You are getting some of those natural sugars, but I'm diluting it down with the water and then adding in some of the salt from relight or uh, element. I'm going to put the red flag up here. Salt is not always bad. I mean, that's a whole nother podcast. I get in debates with people. You need salt. Um, it doesn't mean you should have salt on your, and have French fries all the time, but salt is good. You need it for daily functioning. So I want to mention a couple of things that, um, as we kind of roll things around here a little bit. Um, I know you are, uh, I didn't, I learned things about you. I know A, that you were a professional college swimmer or you swam for, the, so you're a professional, you're an athlete, you're very athletic, you like to optimize your athletic performance. So we talked about the sauna. So we're going to talk about, I know you've been interested in cold plunging and as well as contrast therapy. And then we'll go into kind of what you find that you recommend to yourself for yourself and clients in terms of uh, optimizing their physical performance. Right. So, I mean, sauna definitely is probably one of my favorite tools. And if you can, uh, if you don't have access to a sauna, I mean, most health memberships and clubs do have, you know, saunas, which is a great thing. So if you can get to a sauna, that's great. Hot baths, actually, there is some literature looking at hot baths and how that also can be beneficial as well. Um, not to a point where you're burning, but immersing yourself in a hot bath 
can be great. And this is beyond just like, you know, doing an Epsom salt bath to relax sore muscles and to unwind and improve sleep in the evening. And, you know, it's actually counterintuitive where you would think in the evening, since there's a thermoregulatory component to sleep where your core body temperature has to drop a couple of degrees in order to fall asleep or initiate sleep, you know, actually getting hot and that rebound temperature difference when you get out of that, you know, sauna or that, um, that hot bath can actually initiate deeper sleep and more rapid, um, onset of sleep. Um, but you just want to make sure it's not too, too hot. Um, and this is one of the reasons why people that maybe are, you know, really hot in the evening and have many layers and, and you know, under the covers, um, may not be sleeping as well as those that are typically, you know, colder environments. So sauna, definitely one of those things. If you don't have access, you can do hot baths. Um, another thing that I really enjoy are the cold plunges and cold exposure, deliberate cold exposure in particular. Um, and I think it's one of these, you know, these are all modalities and, you know, we use, we call this a naturopathic medicine, uh, hydrotherapy or constitutional hydrotherapy or contrast hydrotherapy. And it's really the application of water. And, you know, back in the 1800s, you know, deliberate cold and or hot baths were done under the regulation or the oversight of physicians over doctors because it was used as a medical intervention. And, you know, the contrasting of hot and cold therapy, like if you were to go into a hot bath and into a cold bath and vice versa, what that does is it causes almost like the mechanical pumping of your blood vessels because heat is going to cause vasodilation. It's going to open up those blood vessels and cold is going to lead to vasoconstriction. It's going to constrict and narrow the diameter of those arteries. And so by doing this, it's going to improve the plasticity and the way that your arteries are responding to improve, you know, endothelial health and cardiovascular health. Um, it's also going to help with improving circulation of oxygen, rich blood and nutrients all throughout the body. That is something that is always looked at from a place of, you know, uh, sports performance and recovery. And that's why we have things like compression boots, like the Norma tech, um, and, and things like Katsu and other things of blood, blood flow restriction that is going to help to enhance circulation throughout the body. So hot, cold is going to do that type of thing like that. But the other thing that's really interesting about cold in particular is how, um, it is able to reap favorable metabolic benefits as well. And a lot of that is the conversion of white adipose tissue to more beige and or brown fat. Um, and what that means is, is that individuals that you've seen that are athletes that are very lean, that don't have a lot of um, excess body mass and, and, and excess body fat, they typically have a unique type of, of, of fat cells that are more densely populated in mitochondria. So if you do a biopsy of that tissue, of that fat, you would notice that it it has more of a brownish beige color as opposed to this white color. And that brownish beige color comes from more mitochondria, which are the powerhouse of our cell. It's the, the, the power plant and the place with which we take the food that we eat, which is, you know, which ends up being energy. It's, it's the site of where we turn that food into energy. Right. And so we want healthy functioning mitochondria and more densely populated mitochondria, because that's going to help us to better uh, regulate blood glucose levels. It's going to improve insulin sensitivity, um, and help us to regulate our body temperature better when we're out maybe in colder environments, uh, because it's going to be able to generate heat. Our body generates heat, fever, all of that through mitochondria, right? So really it comes back down to the cellular organelles of the mitochondria and our mitochondrial health and deliberate cold exposure helps to generate what is called cold thermogenesis. So the process of creating heat through the direct application or deliberate exposure of cold. Now there are these different fancy, you know, units out there. I have the plunge, the cold plunge. I'm an affiliate with them as well. Um, and so I have an affiliation with them, but I love them. It's, it's an outdoor unit or an indoor unit you can do, and it gets down to 40 degrees Fahrenheit, very cold. Um, but for some people that's out of budget. And so if you can get into a cold lake this winter, that is great. I mean, bearing, it's not like freezing, freezing cold. And like, if there's ice and stuff like that, like, don't do it. No, don't You're do that. That's a, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, but you know, you could do cold lakes, you could do cold showers. Right. And so, you know, kind of the hierarchy of how I see things is deliberate immersion in cold water. And then the next best thing is going to be like cold showers. So you're still getting that cold exposure of water. Um, and then the last would probably be cold air. So like, this is like where I think it gets into like cryotherapy and, um, you know, being outside cold type of thing like that. And so, um, you know, in terms of like frequency of doing it, you don't, 
you know, you need to do it as long as like, let's say the heat stuff. So for like cold, like, you know, anywhere from, you know, one to two to three minutes, even upwards of five minutes, depending on how cold it is at a single time. And this doesn't even necessarily even be done every day. It can be done every other day or getting a total of somewhere between three to eight minutes total in one week of deliberate cold exposure. So just thinking about how you can break that up throughout the week to where you're really you know, getting cold because that's going to improve all these different parameters that we talked about. And it's one of these things that I feel like is more accessible to individuals as opposed to some of these other toys that, you know, we'll talk about, I mean, red light therapy and PMF are my other two favorite things. And we can talk about that, but like, those are less accessible compared to water therapy. And if you have a bathtub, like that is a great thing to, to utilize for sure. DYI. Yeah. You could, it's, you know, I see people, do they just go to this, wherever the convenience store down the street, get six bags of ice and smack it in there. And there's yeah. your cold It's not fancy. It's not filtered, but it's going to achieve the purpose. Again, us cold weather people. And men, like I will intention, a group of us will intentionally, it could be 20 degrees, 30 degrees outside. We go out in t-shirt and shorts, do a, a, a quick, not a quick run, a decent sized run. And it, it works. It sucks. <laughs> and I'm not going to deny it. I mean, I'd rather do a cold plunge in a minute, but it's, you have to, again, you can do why these things you don't need to spend 10, I mean, there are cold plunges that are gorgeous that are 15 K. You don't need it. The only thing I would, a couple of things I want to quickly mention is we know a couple of things just came out that if you do a cold shower, it's a great introduction, like 15, 45 seconds. You don't get, you get the, the, the parasympathetic benefit it will kind of relax you a little bit and you don't get some of the dopamine boost as you would with a cold plunge or things like that. So just, but it's a great entry if you've never done it. And the thing I tell all my patients and in friends who do it, like my wife will not go in no matter what I do, the first 20 minutes or first 20 or 30 seconds when you go into a cold plunge stinks for everybody. I don't, anybody who likes that first 20 or 30 seconds, but once you get your breath, you're, you get in that Zen moment. You, I mean, I've been trained. I try to my breath to about eight to 10 breaths, something even six breaths a minute by holding for five to six seconds, every breath. You just, it's the most Zen thing that you can do in some cases. So don't be scared that first couple of things stink. And also now there's a lot of groups out there, a lot of people out there. And I've had Avi Greenberg, I don't know if you know Avi, through, he's in LA, he goes back and forth, but who will, there, you can definitely get coached. There's great, some great coaches out there that will walk you through the first couple of cold plunges. If anybody has any questions, always just shoot me a question, reach out on social media. I can always uh, link you guys up. So do that. One your of the things- is your best friend. Huh? Your breath is your best breath friend. Breath is your cold right? friend. Exactly. Yeah. So, and I just want you to explain what you do. I, I want you to explain when you do contrast therapy, which is going from the sauna to the cold plunge, give some really, some quick tips on what people should be doing, duration, um, and do you finish on a certain cold or hot? Yeah. And then just so people know what to do. So that always comes yeah. up. So people are always will ask about how long, right? And again, this is going to depend on the individual. If you are young, you're more vital, you're resilient, you're going to be able to tolerate a lot more of these fluctuations in extreme heat and cold. If you're older, elderly, have certain comorbid conditions, you have COPD, asthma, these you want to have some precautions, especially if you have, and also Raynaud's is another contraindication thing you should be considered of with cold, especially extreme cold. Uh, so talk to your doctor about that. But really, you kind of have to, you know, check in with your body of how, you know, and, and really I see your ability to tolerate, you know, these extreme temperature fluctuations is a direct sign of vitality, which is resilience and health. Like health is that barometer with that too. So younger, more resilient, you can probably do more extreme fluctuations and multiple rounds for those that are maybe older age, you know, over the, you know, in their fifties and sixties and seventies, and maybe dealing with certain things may want to not do as extreme of temperatures and, you know, maybe a little bit closer in terms of the variations and maybe only do one round or two rounds or reduce the amount of time. But in general, because people always kind of want to know what are the generalizations, right? What I will do, and I can explain what I do too, it's somewhere probably around like 20 minutes of being in the sauna, um, whether that is infrared or even a dry sauna. If I'm in a dry sauna, it may be more, closer to 15 minutes. And then I like to shoot for at least two minutes in the cold plunge. I feel like that is very doable for some people. If you are not accustomed to the cold, even doing a minute is good. Your breath, as Dr. Paulvin said, is going to be your best friend. So slower inhalations or deep inhalation, but slow exhalations, right? So you really want to try to slow and calm. Your brain is going to be screaming at you thinking, I am not safe. I need to get out of here. And your job with the breath is to calm that nervous system and say, I am safe. Everything's okay. And breathe into it. And it will literally feel like it's going to take your breath away. Right? So that is where I will start with that. 
And you can start with just doing like from your waist down and then you can get up to, you know, your torso and to your chest. And if you can really get all the way up to your neck, that's going to even be better and even dunk your head at the end. Right. But that's something you can work up to with the contrast piece. I like to do a minimum of two rounds where maybe it's 20 minutes in the sauna, two to three minutes in the cold plunge. And then I go back in the sauna for 20 minutes and then, or 15 minutes, and then another finish two to three minutes in the cold plunge. I like to end on cold. That is a very, um, you know, OG naturopathic hydrotherapy thing where the reason why we want to end with cold is so that we are finishing with the blood vessels constricted. It's bringing all the blood flow back to the vital organs. It's preventing venous stasis of blood in the periphery. Cause when we are in heat, it's dilating all those vessels. We're getting blood all the way to the periphery. We really want to bring that back to the vital organs. The other thing too, is that when we end in cold, it's going to force our body to have to heat itself up. That's basically forcing your body to, you know, heat itself up. And that is really, you know, a sign of robust health, right? That's that vital force that is within all of us too. And again, for people that maybe don't have as much of that vitality, they may want to end with a little bit of a warm shower, but don't heat yourself all the way. Like it's beneficial to actually have your body do that unassisted with, you know, additional, like a hot shower type of thing like that, or at least give yourself, you know, 10 minutes before jumping right back into a hot shower. Perfect. I told you, you want to finish on cold. And if you can let your body naturally heat up because that when you're going to get like, like Tyler mentioned, you're going to get the maximal benefits. Um, and what he's talking about, I, I, you mentioned it really quickly. I want to, we're running at, we're coming near the end here, but I, you brought it up about Katsu and which is blood flow restriction, which I get asked about a lot. Do you speak on it? Do you like it? Do you find that it helps your performance? It's great for, there's some studies that are showing that it helps with healing, especially injuries. How do you, do you, how often do you use it? Do you use it a lot um, in terms of the blood flow restriction and the katsu, which is, which is great because it's kind of something you can use by your own. You don't need to go to a therapist or a trainer to do it. Right. Um, I have, it's, it's one of the newer modalities that I started playing with this summer. It is something that, um, I will probably use two to three times a week. And I can't say that I've noticed any benefits. I okay. like, like overt, overt benefits, right? Like, I feel like it's improving circulation. I mean, I have the compression boots at the bottom and then I'll do like the katsu after type of thing. Um, but yeah, it's still too early to tell. And it's just one of those things that I feel like, um, is helping. It's just, I feel like so many people, like we look for these very, like, objective findings of, of some type of outcome to like note that it's benefiting us in some way. I mean, I would definitely try blood flow with a physical therapist or a trainer who knows how to implement it with both when you're doing your workout as well as recovery. Um, Cause if the units can be expensive, if, I mean, some of them could be a couple thousand dollars and some, that's one of those things where I think it could either work really well for you or you may get absolutely nothing. You're like, I just spent $5,000 on this. So that's something you want, definitely want to try out first. Sauna will definitely work. Cold is great. That's one of those things you want to at least try out. So I want to let yourself explain how, how you've kind of developed your career. You went from being a researcher to naturopath at school, and now you become an entrepreneur. You have this full business. So how have you used the health optimization and what you learned in naturopathic school to be the best entrepreneur mm -hmm. and have the best life. I mean, you've kind of, you can kind of pick all these different buckets here and then get to where you are today. I don't know if this is where your goal was 10 years ago, but you're here now you have, I don't know how many thousands, hundreds of thousands of followers and you have courses and you get to travel over the world. How'd you get there? What are there a couple of <laughs> tricks and tools that you've used to get to where you are today? Tricks and tools. I mean, consistency at the end of the day is definitely the secret. I tell everybody that it's like, how do I develop a following? How do I, you know, get X, Y, Z. And if, with anything you stick with something consistently, you show up every day over a three, five, seven year period, like you will make something out of that. Right. But for a lot of us, we throw in the towel too soon, right before we're about to really, you know, hit a breakthrough. And we also get discouraged because we look again for, you know, we're looking for the financial return. We're looking for a certain recognition, right? Like there's a status piece with that as well. And just, um, I feel really grateful in that when I started social media, it was before going to naturopathic school. It was really a way for me to educate because I'm most passionate about education. And uh, one of the things that I loved about the field of naturopathic medicine is one of the core principles is the word docere, which is the Latin word for to teach. And it's really the word and the Latin word from which doctor is derived from. So it means doctor is teacher. And, you know, all this information that we learn in naturopathic school, which is really based on the foundation of how do you optimize health? How do you move those impediments and work with the body? There's so many things we learn in terms of 
these lifestyle factors that I feel like should be information for everyone to have access to, right? Like you shouldn't have to go to your doctor to access these things, or there shouldn't be, you know, you know, all it should be more accessible to people. Like, why is it not more accessible? And so that is really what I've done with my platform over the years. It was really just a way for me to build a name for myself and share a lot of my, my journey of, of health and what I've been learning. And then, you know, the plan was when I graduated school is to open up a private practice and see patients. And, um, you know, I was going to build out a wait list and stuff. And then I was like, you know, I finished school and I was like, what I've been craving honestly is autonomy because I did 15 years of competitive swimming I was in research, then I was in school. It was like literally the last almost 20 years of my life have just been so structured, so disciplined. It's allowed me to get really far in where I am today, which I'm grateful for. Um, but you know, I feel like over the last year and a half, I've like I've really been a craving auto- autonomy, autonomy over my time and 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 really being able to do things on my own terms. And that's something that I'm still riding that wave right now. And it has allowed me to be location independent and do things differently and to, to teach online and do everything from an online perspective, which I'm very grateful for. And uh, launched a course last year, which has been super successful. Um, it's a it's a holistic nutrition course. It's 10 weeks, uh, 20 hours of material. And we really go into all the nuances around nutrition from a very non-dogmatic approach because I don't have a dog in the race. My, my goal is for you to basically take that all for information and know how to apply it as it best relates to you to find food freedom, to know how to leverage food as medicine and how to utilize various different tools as it relates to nutrition to improve your, your health, vitality, etc. So that is something that I launch every quarter. The next launch of that will be in January of 2023. I have a wait list uh, which people can find on my website uh, where they can one, learn more about it, about the course. They can also see a detailed itinerary of what we learn and talk about every week over those 10 weeks and additional resources that are handed out uh, as well as sign up for the wait list as well. So um, there's another, a bunch of different things that I kind of have up my sleeve and new projects that I'm working on for the new year. And uh, really just, you know, taking my time with all of this. I feel like as an entrepreneur, you can always be in this rush comparing yourself to others and feeling like you're behind and you need to do more, more, more. You're on that hamster wheel, right? And just, I think, honoring where I'm at and just realizing there's no race uh, has been something that has been really valuable for me right now. And for anyone that is in that hustle and on that hamster wheel and just so burnt out, like honor that. That was something that used to scare me to take a break, to take a step back, that fear of people passing me, the competitive nature. And um, it has really been so powerful to really come back renewed, more inspired and more creative and ready to tackle new projects and, and, and goals. So. I'm perfect. So you don't, you don't have golden object syndrome where you're like just trying to get the news coolest, the bigger car, the bigger house, the whatever. So-and-so has this. Yeah. You have to be happy with where you are and happy with yourself because that's, if you're not happy with yourself and where you are, then nothing else is going to fulfill you at all. So Besides right. your website, um, where can people find you uh, on social media or anything else you want to hand out? And uh, thanks for coming on. You just gave everybody some incredible information over the last hour. Yeah, thank you for having me. So best place to connect would probably be on Instagram at Dr. D.R. Tyler Jean, J-E-A-N is the last name. Um, I love to post a lot of, you know, very, you know, informative content there and also share my healing journey, what that has looked like there and provide a lot of different resources my website also is a wealth of information as well and have a bunch of different product recommendations, um, different eBooks and resources. And, um, also have my newsletter, which you can also find on my websites. I try to send out emails once to twice a month, uh, with information. So you can also subscribe there on my website. Great. We'll check it out. We'll put all those links in the, in the show notes on all the, uh, podcast channels. So again, thanks Dr. Tyler Jean for hopping on. Definitely check him out wherever he is. And he's, he's all over the place and he's definitely check out the nutrition course. Cause I'm sure he's taught you something today. So thanks for hopping on to life optimized. Stay tuned for the next podcast.